You are watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, we're talking about deep vein thrombosis and what you can do about it and how big of a problem it is. And according to my first guest, he says, oftentimes it's being misdiagnosed that you have a problem, especially that first episode, which is a mm -hmm. small episode. With us, we have, uh, in fact, one of the most popular pulmonologists in the country, Dr. <laughs> Dasgupta. Dr. Dasgupta, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Well, it's you are, you're on here. the doctors. Oh, you're hot right now. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? Let me just add on to your, that introduction that we're not only gonna be talking about deep band thrombosis, okay. but the add-on to it, which is the pulmonary embolism. Okay. So let me give you some statistics. In the United States, right now, 50,000 people are dying each year of a pulmonary embolism. I think that warrants That's a, a little clot, segment. That's a clot, like in their legs? Well, it starts off in the legs. So when we talk about those exact words, pulmonary embolism, it's a blockage of blood flow in the lungs. And that blockage could oh, be anything, lungs, okay. Randy. Anything. That could be like a fat globule that happens, and I see that in trauma patients, they have fractures of the long bones. I could see that when you have bacteria that form these septic emboli going into lungs. But traditionally, the word pulmonary embolism means a clot. And using doctor talk, that means a thrombus. Okay. And where do these right. thrombuses come from? The lower extremities, the pelvic and our legs, the deep veins in our legs. And that's why I use the word deep vein thrombosis. Okay. All right. So you say that there are people yes. that have a, uh, like their first pulmonary embolism. Yes. That don't even know they had one. Correct. Is that right? So what are those symptoms? Okay. And where do they normally get them? Right. And what do you do about it? So let's talk about the pulmonary embolism part of it. You okay. know, when I was in med school, you read these textbooks, and they give you the very traditional ways things present. P will have a chest pain. It may be a pleuritic chest pain. What does that mean? Yeah, what does it mean? When you take a deep breath, you get that catching, aching sensation right there. That you may have a fast heart rate when you feel your pulse. But you know what? Out of my experience being a pulmonologist, they don't follow these textbooks. I wish they did. And that's why sometimes it goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And that's why I wanted to make people aware that it could be the atypical presentations that need you to get picked up. Which are what? You know what? Sometimes you can present with coughing up a little blood. Sometimes wow. forbid that you could present with a fainting episode, and that probably is gonna be one of those serious type events. Or sometimes, you know what? It gets to be a little fluttering that you don't realize you're having. Oh, I'm just having little palpitations. But when we talk about these symptoms, remember Randy, you have to take it with each patient. What is that patient's risk factors? Because risk factors and symptoms gives you that probability of making the right diagnosis. Okay, and those, uh, and you said 50,000 people yes. are dying of this, maybe even within the first hour yes. of having it. Correct. Chances are they had a, a prior. I like that, right? I have to Is say right? correct. No, okay. you're dead on with that. And they didn't do anything about it. No, they did not. Okay. Yep. So what, what can they do? So let me talk about the risk factors. I think yeah. it's a good yeah, segue the, into yeah. talking about that. So what are the risk factors? Number one, obesity. Okay. Number two, smoking people are gonna be in that post-operative type situation where they're in that medical bed, they're not moving around because of the surgery, we can't thin out the blood. People are on medications. What jumps to my mind? Estrogen, or drugs that contain the estrogen. And the big one that I think applies to everywhere in society is immobility, not moving. And why do I personally wanna bring this out? That yeah. when I'm not being the doctor at USC and trying to help patients, I actually work for Kaplan Medical. I go around the world teaching board review, teaching the United States medical license exam to foreign grads, U.S. grads to help pass our board exams here. And I'm on these planes, I'm on these trains going across the country. And I sometimes just chuckle a little bit because when we talk about, uh, you know, getting the, the immobility that happens of developing a clot in your legs, or your lungs, sometimes I feel the airports are in cahoots with forming DVTs and pulmonary embolism. Why? Before you go on the plane, there's always a section in the airport to have a cigarette. Interesting. Yeah. Then when you go on the plane, what do they offer you right away? Hey, how about a little alcohol to knock you out? And those are things that will probably make you get a clot on that plane trip. Why? Because if you're going to be knocked out from that beer, that wine, whatever you drink, you're not going to move around. Okay, so when you say immo immobility, you're yeah. not talking about a person with a broken leg. You're talking about people that are staying in one place for a long time. Correct. Like on a plane. Like on a plane. You've got to be type A personality. So it has nothing to do with your legs being pressed against the cushion. It has to do with not moving. With not moving, and that's why simple tips can help you out when you're on that plane. You know what, if you're, too, uh, if you're not gonna tell the person next to you you're smushed up against the window to move, and you're gonna be in your seat the whole time, do some exercises. Take your feet like you're pushing the gas. I know, I'm okay. laughing and you're laughing. Do you do it? 
you know what? I will do it. Not just because I'm here talking to you, because you know what? I'm sometimes in that horrible seat. No one's going to move. And I'm stuck there for five like hours. you're by the window. Hours. Exactly. You know? And so anyways, do these little exercises. Move your feet in circles. And That's all you have to lift do. your legs. Lift your knee. I'm telling you, do that once every hour on the plane. And trust me, it, the alternative of not doing these little funny exercises could be life-threatening. And how often, and by the way, are, there, are yeah. there any stats off the top of your head, approximately how many people get these on planes? You know what? Or do they get the mild ones on planes? And I like that we brought this up. I'm always going to be the honest doctor and say that most people who have a DVT or P, they're not going to die, Randy. But like in any disease, there is that portion right there that when you get it, or that second one, like you said, if you get one, it's a higher risk for the next one. That could be the time that you're okay. in that pie. So you're yep. on the plane, and yes. all of a sudden you get a little bit of a rapid heart rate. Correct. You're, uh, you have, it hurts a little bit when you exhale. Did you ah, say that? You're, yes. There's that pleuritic chest pain. Right. So you have some pain. It's usually rapid on onset. You kind of take a deep breath, and it may be a catching sensation. Feels okay when you breathe in. It usually it's going to be somewhat localized. You can try to get the air in, but you know what? When you have a pain, what do you usually do? Stop breathing. You can't take the, mm -hmm. the night's deep breath. So what do you do? You start taking shallow breaths. That's going to be a whole cascade of what happens in the lungs. Shallow breathing leads to other problems. So if you're in that plane, you're on estrogen, you're a smoker, you're a little bit overweight, you just had a surgery a few days ago, it's a flight to Australia from California, you might want to think about it. So just move. Yep, just move. Whatever kind that of That should move. be the t-shirt we both make. Just move. Just right on move. the plane, exactly. Well, well, okay, so estrogen. And one more thing, Randy, you yeah. can go back to that hydration. Which is why I'm laughing, is that you know when you're on the plane, they give you alcohol. You know what makes you dehydrated? Alcohol. Okay. What do some people do before going on the plane? They smoke. You know what makes you dehydrated? Smoking. So keep well hydrated. Don't smoke before the plane. What about caffeine? Because that constricts. Uh, you know what? Caffeine is another thing that dehydrates you. That's why when after I do a jog or you're doing a jog, we don't chug some cola. It's just going to dehydrate you some more, and so does coffee. So when you, yeah, I, I mean, you deal with some severe problems yeah. in, at USC, okay? Yep. When they do a history yep. of the partner or whoever right. was with them, right. are they, when, when, uh, of these people that are dying from this, yes, is it always because they were, yeah, they we were sitting on something, or he was sitting on the couch, or fell asleep on the couch? Yeah, you is know, is it what? usually something like that? So when I see, so it's so not I like do, during golf or whatever. I usually see it when I'm practicing critical care at USC. So what happens is that unfortunately, you know, in the hospital we have a, a code situation, and these are usually patients that come in and their blood pressure was low, their heart rate is very high, their respiratory rate was very fast, and we didn't know exactly what was going on. And next thing you know, that code gets called overhead and they have that, their first presentation of Forsey is death. Is that right? It's sad, but, but it happens. But to answer the question, yeah. when you ask the relatives or friends or whoever was around them, was it usually because they were immobile for quite some time? It's usually finding that risk factor. And immobility, yes, that's one of those risk factors, that he didn't move around. He just came back from a flight. He just came back from or a Or it trip. was an episode after drinking a lot or after... I don't want to ma no? mislead anyone and say it's the drinking itself, but it's usually someone who's so it's just immobile. very sedentary lifestyle. And by the way, is it more people over 50, over 60, over 70? Well, it's going to be higher in age. If you're going to be a younger person in you develop a clot, there could be reasons that you have protein deficiencies in your body, genetics, antibodies. So 70 plus yeah. are more likely? As you get older, I'm not going to say okay. 70 as a cutoff, but as you get older, there's a high risk for malignancy, which is cancer. There's a high risk of being immobile. I assume that the 70 or 80 year old doesn't run as much as a 20 or 30 year old. So yes, it's okay. a little skewed as you get a little bit older. But what if somebody says, you know, I, yep. I, you know I, I, I've been to my physical, check my blood pressure, I have a zero calcium score, mm -hmm. I'm feeling good, mm -hmm. not likely to get something like this? I would say that's where if you don't have those risk factors that we mentioned and some that we don't mention, it still should not prevent you from being, you still shouldn't be sedentary. What are other medications, you mentioned estrogen, what yeah. are other medications that can uh, cause this well, or contribute to a higher risk? Well, I would say that any type of sedative that, per that will prevent you from exercising or moving around. So like a sleeping pill on the plane? Exactly. You said it. You know, I know. You know, in that plane, that's when you want to be the most alert. That's when really? you want to move. Yes. Not even just for the pee, just in general. And you know what I see sometimes? I think I make a diagnosis of sleep apnea more when I'm sitting on the plane than anything else. Interesting. So yeah. when you're on a plane, are you nervous for certain people ever? <laughs> I are think, you? you know, being a doctor, I think that we always are looking at, uh oh, you know, I mean, he may or may not have this. But, you know, I think that when we're going across the country more than the four or five hour flight, 
I do hope that everyone takes no. the opportunity to go no, no Until highway. today, I've never yep. paid attention to this yes. problem, this disease. I do know that in some of the airline magazines, they have some of these tips. They do. Right? Correct. Are they missing anything? When you look at an ad or you look at this little tip, yep. are any of those tips missing something that you'd like to add to it? I would have to say that the tips they give, the movements, the getting around is wonderful. I think they should encourage the smoking sensation the drinking. I think they should talk about being well, well hydrated when you're on the plane itself. Okay. Yeah, I think those are things that, you know, are not innately in the pamphlet that may just have a nice little touch if they mention it. Okay, good. Yep. Well, final message though yep. to uh, anybody if they want to find out more or well, if they think that, and let, let's let's do this. If somebody's flown on a plane, they're saying, right. yeah, I had a rapid heart rate. Yeah. Yeah, I had a shortness of breath, but it went away and I thought it was indigestion. Yeah. They may have had an episode. They so now they could potentially could be in trouble. And remember, so those are the symptoms, people that need to see you? And their symptoms could be in two places because we started off the conversation with a deep vein thrombosis. They could have leg pain, swelling, leg redness. Pain. Okay, but it went away during the plane. It may have. And you know where we said most of those pulmonary embolisms come from? The deep veins. And that's why PE and DVT sometimes gets used in the same sentence. Okay. So if you have symptoms in your lower extremities or in the chest, like we talked about, hey, so you may it always, bring it always up. the chest pains are accompanied by this. Is that correct? So when they use the word pulmonary embolism, yeah. that's going to mean we assume the clots traveled up to the lungs. And that's why you're having the breathing problems and hopefully not those blood pressure problems also. So go get checked. Go get checked. All right. Yeah. Think, very interesting topic. Always a pleasure. No wonder everybody <laughs> wants you on their show. Oh, thank you. All right. So All thanks right, again. You've been watching the Wellness Hour, leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. We'll be right back.